Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how's everybody? Great. Awesome. Are you excited? Yeah. Yes. We're going to start creating our speeches. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yay. Time to get on. Well, we better start figure it out. Figure it out now. All right. Uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about creating this speech. We, in a previous session, we talked about the planning aspects of it. So now we're going to get it to start creating it. And uh, I worked a long time on creating how I do this so that it would be as simple as possible for you guys and, 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 it would, it, and be really helpful for you as well. Now, anybody ever heard of Dale Carnegie? Yeah. Okay. Who was there? There's a picture of him. Who was Dale Carnegie? He built Carnegie Hall. Well, that's <laughs> 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 well, that was a different Carnegie. Oh, I got the wrong one too. Can you write that book? Which on how to win friends and influence people. Yeah, he wrote a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. He also uh, developed one of the first public speaking courses in the United States. And he wrote several books on public speaking. And uh, you remember Aristotle, right? Aristotle was really considered probably one of the first speech teachers. He created an academy in ancient Greece. And what Dale Carnegie did was kind of the same thing, but he did it here in the United States. And it was in, uh, in New York City. At, he taught it at the, y, the YMCA. <laughs> Doesn't get to do, uh, break into a dance. No. You don't want to see me dance. Yeah, we do. It, people will leave. We do. How many people want to watch him dance? No. Woohoo! Census is on. Oh, oh my. He, like I said, he offered several books. Uh, Effective Speaking was one that uh, I've read, and uh, I have several others that I have uh, acquired along the way. But. Uh, like you said, his most famous book is probably How to Win Friends and Influence People. So a lot of what he taught, public speaking wise, works relationship wise, works works in everything, and that's how I look at public speaking. What you learn here, you carry over into other areas as well of your life. He said this. He says, your purpose is to make your audience see what you saw. Hear what you heard, feel what you felt. This is in regards to a speech. Think those are important? See what you saw, hear what you heard, and feel what you felt. Very important. Relevant detail couched in concrete, colorful language is the best way to recreate the incident as it happened and to picture it for the audience. So what's he saying here? Any talk like, thoughts? Talk like Don King? <laughs> well, That's the first thing I thought of. I, the first thing that comes to my mind is that he, want, you, he wants to create um, like a visual image within the listener so that when he's speaking, you can see what he's talking about in your head. Okay. You know, with this, if he's... Um, detailed or colorful language or it gets the audience, you know, then we can kind of picture it better. Okay. So the speech, so any speech that you have heard, if it has these elements, it's one you remember, correct? Yeah. If you don't have all of those elements, it's going to be, you know, whatever. I think also um, the speakers usually speaking about something that he's very passionate about and not everybody in the audience is going to have those same feelings. So if you recreate it um, the way that you see it and portray your passion through your speech, I think that's what we mean by that. Yeah, exactly. And so that's the goal. This is the goal of what we're trying to accomplish here. We want to get you to 
have the audience see what you saw, feel what you felt, and hear, hear what you heard. Because really, in any kind of communication, you're trying to recreate something. If you heard something and you repeat it back, word for word, the words will be the same, but maybe how you present it is going to be different. And so he, he, what he's saying here is be, be con conscious of these elements as we go through the process. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna set a goal for our speech. This is the first step in the creation process. Purpose is very important, isn't it? You need to know your purpose. It's really why the why of the speech. Now sometimes you'll do these in classes where it's an assigned speech, such as this one, but in a lot of cases, people are going to ask you, and it'll be something you have a passion for. So you know what your why is in that sense. That's why I asked you guys to pick subjects that you know. A hobby is, a, is an example of that. Now, I'm, I'm just going to ask a couple of you, by raising hands, how many of you have a subject that you're thinking about? Okay, let's just kind of, Joe, what, what about it? So mine's kind of unusual. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, is this a how-to speech? It's, a, it's an informative speech. Yeah. Or a how-to, yes. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm starting a business on uh, filtering people's home internet. And so it's going to be a, a how-to on how to filter your internet. Okay. All right. Um, I'm doing mine on African drumming. Okay. Any others? So Mine's kind of abstract, so I don't really want to say it out loud yet. Oh, well, we're just looking for the basic subject. Mm -hmm. Like um, attitude, creating a good attitude. Okay. Good, so good one. Is. Okay. You don't have, have to be motivated and exuberant for that one. <laughs> I know. I hope it's a good day. <laughs> I hope it's a happy day. It will be. It will be. Don't That's say. Right. It will be. Don't say hope. It will be. Okay. Nicotine okay. okay. patches. I hope I. Any do others? Something bad that <laughs> you guys are thinking about. What are, What are some of your hobbies? Those of you who are having struggle. What are your What's your hobby? My son. Okay. Do a speech on. Your son? Yeah. My son is my hobby. I don't. Mm. Well, it, it will work. That's right. I've had students do that before. How old is he? He's six. Okay, so that's a good one. Any of the others that are undecided? What's your hobbies? Yep. I'm a gamer. That's a hobby. Okay, I've had several speakers on different games. So whatever game that is your passion. Do it on um, the Mario Brothers. Give me all the links. <laughs> the little tricks. My son wants to know how to get on the Mario Brothers. The easiest thing to pick is the thing that you'd love to do the most. So whatever your hobby is, pick that. You already have a built-in passion for it, right? If you like scrapbooking, ladies, guys, if you like scrapbooking, we'll take it. You can do it on scrapbooking, right? It will run, I will tell you, it will run the gamut as you guys do your presentation. So, why do we set a goal? Because a goal that is not written is only a wish. So we're, we're going to go through the process of writing this down. So if you follow the handout I gave you, and we're, we're going to make this work, okay? I've given you one to do notes on here in class, and then I've provided for you in the packet four extra sheets of this. Uh, speech creation worksheet that uh, I'm, I'm, we're going to go through so that you can use them for each of your speeches, okay? So we're, that's how we're going to write this down, this goal, okay? So let's talk about establishing a purpose. There are two kinds to consider. The first one is a general purpose. And 
then the next and the other one is specific. Now, in most textbooks, the definitions are a little bit different. A general purpose in most of the textbooks means that you're going to inform. Let's see. Now I have it up here. Your general purpose is to inform, which means to expand knowledge or skill, to persuade, change somebody's thinking or feeling, and to entertain, which is for enjoyment. So a comedian getting up and uh, giving a presentation, if you want to call it that. Uh, he's, he's, his purpose is to entertain, isn't it? Yes. Okay. And sometimes in general conversation, a lot of people like to talk, and that's what they do, and, and that's their passion. But most of the ones that we deal with here is to form and persuade. Okay? That's the extent of a general purpose in most of your textbooks. You'll see another thing in some of the textbooks called a thesis statement. And what a thesis statement is, it takes the inform, persuade, and entertain, and adds the subject to it. Again, most textbooks. So if you take another class, someone, when they talk about this, they will bring up general purpose, and thesis, okay? To me, it was kind of confusing because thesis to me, having done a master's degree, I had to do a master's thesis, okay? My thesis was about that thick, okay? So when I saw a thesis statement, I went, okay, it doesn't match up with what I'm thinking, okay? My experience base, does that make sense? And so what I've, what I've done here is actually, um, catch up here, and I know it's confusing for others, so what I did is I changed the definitions a little bit for the purpose of this, this cl uh, class. I combined the definitions of both the general purpose and the thesis statement and made it a uh, thesis, I mean a general purpose. That is what I'm defining general purpose as. So what it will look like, I want to, and in this case you, you circle, inform my audience about whatever the subject is. So whatever your subjects are, you know, if you follow along and do this, um, <coughs> You can fill in the blanks here, and we will get you through this process so that you, by the end of the day, you will have your speech half written. So in this case, the example I'm going to use today, I want to inform my audience about snowboarding. That is my general purpose. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. The next thing we do is move on to our specific purpose. And this is where we take the subject and we break it down into its different parts or its specifics. So, how we're going to do that today, we're going to take this, we're going to take this purpose statement that we've already, general purpose that we've already written, I want to inform my audience about snowboarding, and then we're going to create three main points for you to talk about. So how do we do that? One of the most effective ways that I found for myself, and, and of course, what works for me, I like to share, okay? And anybody heard of mind mapping or concept mapping before? <coughs> uh, um, what concept mapping is, it's a diagram that represents words, ideas, uh, whatever it is that you're trying to do. In fact, I've it's interesting, I've 
I, there was a teacher that I worked with one time that used a mind map as he was teaching his class. And so he would write on the board. He already knew what he was going to talk about, so he mind mapped it out in order rather than how we're going to do it today. But that's how he did it, and people wrote their notes that way, and they were able to remember what he was talking about. But what it's used to do is gener gen generate, visualize, and structure, and classify all your ideas. And you can use this also for studying. You can organize, problem solve, and make decisions as well. So is that you want us to use mind mapping in our presentation? Or? It, 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 this is just one of the tools okay. to help you put it together. And because that's what I use, I'm going to teach it to you because a lot of people haven't used this before. Okay. Okay? But this would be one of the tools. You can do it however you want. But this is just a tool for you to do that with. Mind mapping was, uh, it made its name, he's, he's the one that kind of made this famous, is Tony Bazan. He's a psychology, a British psychology author. Um, he created mind mapping in the name of mind mapping. Uh, when you get ideas, most of the time it's not going to come to you point A, point B, point C. You're going to, as you think about whatever it is you're going to do, you're going to, things are going to come to you haphazardly. I know as an author, my books didn't come chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. I think that in one book I started out with the middle chapter and then kind of bounced around as I was researching and, and things like that. And then I turned around and put it into a logical order. Brainstorming is another word for this. And a lot of people have done brainstorming uh, in this way. So you, what we're doing, what I'm going to show you is as you start thinking about your ideas, you're going to put them down as you, as they come to your head. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I used to just write this on the board, but uh, because it's PowerPoint, I can't do it how I really want to do it, but this will give you an idea. So what you do, the, the subject I'm going to choose here is snowboarding. This is what I want to talk about. Anybody snowboard? Oh, good, good. We've got several people that can help with this. If I'm going to talk about snowboarding, what are some of the things that I could talk about in a speech? Side view board. Okay. Yeah, equipment. Equipment. Okay. I would, I would probably start by talking about why, why I'm a good person to talk about snowboarding. Okay, uh, set a foundation for your credibility, why, why you're the speaker for it. But you can do that in the introduction, but if we're here. Yeah. So you can do it several ways. Any others? What are some other things involved in snowboarding? Similarity, what it's similar to. Okay. If someone's never heard of snowboarding, you might want to talk about how it came about, right? History. history. The history of it, okay. Uh, you might want to talk about how to dress. Clothing, okay, there's a, there's another. What what kind of clothing it is, do we use in snowboarding, okay. Social norms. What's that? Okay. Places you can go, okay. So there, that's another subject. What else? Cost. Cost, could go with you could integrate that in pretty much any part of those. Uh, technique, maybe. Okay. Well, those are the four that I kind of came up with as I've been teaching this. And, and so what's going to happen is, is you're going to, you'll start with the, I can use pictures because we all love pictures. Um, but I have a picture still over there and you'll see that I'll, uh, one of the subjects we talked, we thought we could come up with would be history, and and what will happen is, is you you could start out with technique, you could start out with places to go wherever, but because I want to just put this up and make it work PowerPoint wise, I apologize, but uh, what then you're going to do is what about the history? So you'll come up with several different 
ideas. And like I said, they they all won't. This is not working. Okay, there we go. Uh, places, technique, and and you see. As you think about these different areas, you're going to have. How about places? Where 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 could we go snowboarding? Is there places you can't? Anywhere there's not snow. <laughs> yeah. Some resorts don't allow you to snowboard. Really? That's true. Alta. Alta is one. Yeah. Is it Deer Valley or have they changed? I'm not sure. I think I heard, I heard Deer, Deer Valley. It was more of the elite uh, oh. resort or something. I was just thinking. So elite people don't snowboard. Huh? I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> no, elite people ski. <laughs> oh, okay. Elite people ski. But that, for whatever reason, there are resorts that don't allow you to snowboard. So you could break this down even further. Which ones allow you to, which ones don't? Okay. Um, technique. There, what is it? Is this a goofy stance, right? What else? What's that? Regular. regular, goofy and regular. It's a whole new language. That's all I know. <laughs> um, there's like, you know, freestyle versus downhill. Versus park. Okay. So there's different techniques, aren't there? Okay. And then of course, equipment, you could break down to the boards, boots, clothing, whatever you need to do. Okay, so in looking at all of those, you know, can you see how this is mapping out? And, and all you're doing is sitting there brainstorming and thinking, and you could probably have offshoots of some of those other, of those other circles even. Okay, you don't limit yourself just to what you see here. Just keep, keep brainstorming at it, and eventually you'll come up with in this case, we came up with four basic subjects and then some offshoots of those subjects. Now, if we're putting this together and we're going to form our audience about it, do you think there's a main that we choose? Let's say we choose the chronological outline of a speech, and we're going to talk about that in a later discussion. So let's say we choose chronologically to put this together. What what do you think the chronological order of this would be? History. Okay, so history might be number one. And then what? Equipment. There is no. Okay, equipment. Technique. Technique. Or places first. And, um, and places. So you have to decide which That's is gonna be the most effective chronological order if you choose the chronological outline. Does it make sense? Okay. Now, I've limited you to five minutes. Do you think this speech would take longer than five minutes? Yes. Yeah. Mm, not necessarily. If you hurry through it. If you hurry through it. <laughs> but to do it effectively, that's what we're trying to do here, right? Mm -hmm. We're trying to do this effectively. Which one do you think we could eliminate that could be a speech by itself. History. Okay. Maybe. Courtney. I would, in my in my thinking, technique. I, I mean, there's a lot of techniques. Obviously, that one I would think you could make a speech by itself. So if we're doing a five-minute speech and we're just giving real basic information, we could go history, equipment, and then places to go. So we'll. We'll take technique off of there and change the number to three. So what have I done then with this? Just narrowed down your talk. I've narrowed, narrowed down my speech, haven't I? So um, well, I'll show you how this works. Here is a picture of one I found on the internet someone doing a mind map for snowboarding. You can see it's it's a little bit different, isn't it? Than what I came up with. I think we got clothing is here. It's kit. 
I guess the equipment. Offshoots of beer and music. <laughs> beer and music. Uh, style. That would be technique. Stance. So I mean, there. This is how, what one person came up with in creating a a mind map for snowboarding. So it, it what we came up with and what that person came up with a little bit different, isn't it? It really depends on what you come up with in, in this. So then, what we're going to do then, after we've mind mapped it out, we take the general purpose, which says I want to inform my audience about snowboarding, and how I'm going to do that is talk about history, equipment, and places. That is your specific purpose. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Is it simple? Yes. Your speech is half written. You already know what you're going to talk about. You know which areas you're going to cover. Now at this point, all we have to do is fill in the holes, don't we? Where are we going to, what, what are we going to talk about in history? What are we going to talk about in equipment? What are we going to talk about in places to go? Basically what we're doing here is organizing our ideas and the reason that we organize our ideas is because we, we've, had, we've established our purpose, but to, in organizing our ideas we provide, we're going to provide clarity, which you're, you're going to make it clear, the credibility so that the audience is with you, and the confidence, knowledge of the subject. These three things are very important when it comes to organizing your ideas. You've probably heard this before. What we're, what we're trying to do in establishing our, when we outline our speeches and organizing them, we're going to, in the, in the essence of the speech, we're going to tell them what we're, you're going to tell them, you're going to tell them, then you're going to tell them what you told them. And many people, Mark Twain's made and given credit for this. Uh, in Dale Carnegie's book, Effective Speaking, it was actually credited to someone back near Aristotle's days. Okay? So, um, I don't know who the actual instigator of the quote is, but it's an effective thing. And when you think, start thinking of speeches, you need to tell them what you're gonna tell them, you're gonna tell them, and then you're gonna tell them what you told them. What we've done in creating the outline is we're, we're setting up that middle part of the speech. We have our introduction, we have our body, which is broken down into main points and sub points, and then we have our conclusion. So let's talk for, about the body of the speech. This is the first thing that we need to do. And to get, and, and so what we need to do is, how do we, now that we have our main points, how do we get our sub points? What do we need to do? Research. Okay, we need to do research. Some of it you already know, but it's going to require some research. There are two kinds of research. There's primary research, which is research that you do. That means it's research when you, you create maybe a, a profile or a survey or something into, into that sense, or you interview someone. This is research where you come up with the questions and you gather the answers. Does that make sense? The secondary research is research that you get from the library, the internet. Be careful with the internet, folks, because anybody can put anything up there. And uh, so if you find something on the internet that's interesting, that would might work for your speech, try to delve into it a little bit deeper, see if there's actually a reference to it. It's very important that you do that. But don't just believe everything on the internet. Just don't. 
don't believe the world's coming to an end. This is our last year of life. Yeah. For 2012. <laughs> too many people freaking out about 2012, right? Or they're partying a lot more this year. Yeah, that might be it too. But secondary research is research that someone else has done, and you're using it. Interesting enough, I was I, in my first book on it, I call it simplicity of learning. Uh, in it, I uh, talked about different learning, learning styles, thinking styles, listening styles, to kind of set a foundation. And in it, I read a book, uh, and, I, and the author's mind slips my mind at the moment here. But what ended up happening is I, I was reading, when I was reading his book, I, he was trying to prove another theory that he had, but he had done this research and as I looked at the numbers and things, I saw something completely different based on what I was researching, but his data validated what I was trying to accomplish, even though that wasn't his initial purpose. Is that it? That, and so it's interesting what you can find out there. And uh, so they, you have to do research. Okay, let's take this even further. You guys are gonna do informative and persuasive speeches, so let's talk about the patterns that are available to us. Uh, and under informative speeches, you have a chronological pattern, which means it goes in order of time. So if you're trying to explain the history of something, you would have to start at the beginning and work through, right? Anybody ever walked into the middle of a conversation before and you had no clue what they were talking about? This is kind of the same, in the same sense in that they were explaining something in a chronological sense. You came in halfway through the, the, the pattern and, and so you didn't have the foundational material that had been set up. So chronologically, you're, you're doing it in that order. There's spatial organization. What is spatial? Any thoughts? Ever heard? Has anybody ever heard that term before? Yes, I've heard it. Not sure? Not sure, but it's just yeah. pieces of, of different, I mean, not chronological. Well, what, what, can, what kind of confuses it is a T. If you took a, put a C there, spatial, okay, you're organize it, organizing it by space. Does that make sense? So let's say you're a real estate person. Do you go through a house talking about the carpet in every room and then the wallpaper in every room? You don't do that, right? I know Joe does real estate, right? So you talk about each of the rooms specifically, right? Or you show it specifically mm -hmm. when you go and show a home, right? So you talk, so in some cases you talk about, first you talk about the living room and then you talk about the kitchen. So you're taking each space and doing that. A little more specific, maybe under topic. Let's say you have a main topic like discrimination. How many different forms of discrimination are there? a lot, right? Age, gender, uh, race, all of these can be under that one topic, right? You could talk about discrimination and, and then talk about each, each of those specifically. Under persuasive organization, there's a couple of different things, and we're going to go into more detail on how these are put together. I'm just giving you the names now. But we'll go into more detail with them at a, in a later uh, segment here. But uh, you have cause and effect. How would, how would cause and effect be organized, do you think? Any thoughts? I don't know if what I'm thinking has anything to do with what I was just thinking of. Like when somebody, 
somebody tries to irritate us or anger us and then we have an effect, um, I mean, the same thing with maybe, we're trying to figure out the causes. Yeah, or we're trying to trigger a response, like trigger an emotion or, or okay. from the audience, thereby causing a some kind of a response, whatever you're trying to create from them. Okay, so you have an end result. That I think you have to look, to look at this backwards. You have this end result, the effect. What caused that? And so you could go through and talk about the causes. Does that make sense? It's kind of a backwards approach, but you're starting with the end result. You have problem solution. Okay, here we have problems. What are solutions? So you could start out listing all of the problems, then take the next segment of your uh, speech and talk about how you can fix that or a solution to it. You'll see this in sales, advantage, disadvantage. Okay, here's this product and here's this product. This is my product and this is why it's better. Blah, blah, blah. Does that make sense? Salesmen will use that. This is the one that most people use and it's called the motivated sequence. And the motivated sequence um, is um, just kind of give you a quick example. Um, it, it's broken down. Uh, you've ever been to buy a car, right? And they go in and the salesman introduces themselves, finds out what your needs are, and then presents those needs to let you go out and uh, test drive the car so you visualize and then you sign on the dotted line. That, in essence, is the motivated sequence. And again, we'll go into more detail. We'll, we'll break this down even further how that works, okay? But understand that there's the motivated sequence, which is the most popular. Once we have our body developed, then we, can, then we go back to the introduction. Why is that? Kind of seems redundant, right? To, to start out with an introduction, if you don't know what you're gonna talk about, right? So we develop the body first. And then we, we say, okay, I want to introduce this presentation. And I want to make sure that people are engaged in what I'm talking about. So you want to make this is where you're going to make your first impression with your audience. You want to get their attention. You want to give them a reason to listen to you. You want to set the tone of your speech. You want to establish your qualifications. And Joe, I think this is where what you were talking about when we were talking about snowboarding. You want to establish your qualifications. This is where you do it. You, 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 if we're introducing our speech and we're talking about snowboarding, you would say, I've been snowboarding for 10 years, 20 years, whatever, however long you have been doing it. That establishes a qualification with your audience. You know, can you imagine someone get up, you know, I've never been snowboarding, but I'd like to tell you about it. You know, there's not very much qualified qualifications established there, yes. They would prove to be a good speaker, though, if they went through all of it, impressed them to do that, and then at the very end said, but I've actually never been. And then you go, wow, he was actually pretty good at telling us about the topic. Yeah. You know, that would prove a good speaker. But again, but again, <laughs> you know, most people, if you want to be an effective speaker, you want to establish that credibility. Uh, and then you'll go in and preview it. You've already written the preview. Today I want to talk to you about snowboarding. And I'm going to talk about history, I'm going to talk about equipment, I'm going to talk about places you can go. That's your preview. You've already written it. So you just do all the stuff and we'll talk about how you actually uh, get the audience's attention, give them reason to listen and, and so on and so forth. And so how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, we may ask a question. And a lot of times you'll hear the uh, rhetorical question. What is a rhetorical question? Any 
thoughts? A question that's not really there to be answered. It's just there to get you thinking. Okay. Yeah, most of you'll be asked a question, but the, the speaker's not expecting an answer from you. It's to, like you said, get your mind going. Get you to understand the subject. So that's a good way of introducing a, a, a subject. Stories. We all like stories, right? We can relate to those. Anybody that has kids or has been a kid knows that when mommy or daddy comes in and uh, reads them a book, since they were little, they like stories, right? And so it hasn't changed. The older we get, it hasn't changed. A lot of us like stories. And so we can use a story to introduce what we're talking about. This story, that we, and, and all of these, it has to relate to the subject that you're talking about. So if we're using snowboarding in this example, you might tell a story about an experience you had that will set up what you're going to talk about. Quotes. Maybe you haven't established yourself as an expert yet. You're somewhat of an expert. Okay? <coughs> If you have certain views or whatever it might be about something and you find a quote that validates that point, use a quote. I like, when I start my classes up, I always like to use quotes because it validates what I'm going to present the rest of the time. We can use statistics, we can use numbers. I'm thinking about, you know, maybe what, what would be some numbers that would, we could start out and say, did you know that such and such percentage of students that go to Dixie State are female? And say it's a high number, something that people didn't realize. Does that make sense? And so you, you kind of get their attention. Wow, I did not know that. Does that make sense? And so what it does is it gets the audience's attention Say, oh, well, I'm gonna, I would like to listen to this and figure out what's going on. We can also use humor, but uh, be cautious with humor. Humor tends to be offensive in most cases to, uh, to different groups of people. So if you do use humor, be sure that it relates to the subject first and foremost, but at the same time, is not offensive to your audience. Because you don't, you offend your audience, they walk out on you, good to speak with nobody there. Okay? So we've, we've done our introduction. Now we're going to go into the conclusion. How are we going to conclude this speech so it's an effective thing for the audience? Well, I've heard people that have given lame comments like, okay, I'm done. That's not an effective way to close a speech out. So don't use lame comments like that. You would use many of the same things as we talked about before. Questions, stories, quotes, statistics, humor. I, an example of a story that's kind of set up this way, uh, there was a gentleman some years ago on radio named Paul Harvey. You guys have made, may have may or may not have heard of him. But what he had is he, he I remember I would listen to the radio and come on at five o'clock every day. And what he would do is a little five minute thing. And he'd start out telling a story and you had no clue who he was talking about. And then he'd go into the commercial and he'd do it in such an interesting way that you had to wait through the commercial to figure out what, what he was talking about. And then he'd come back and he'd go, now for the rest of the story. And then he would tell the <coughs> more of the facts and who this person was by name and, and things like that. And it was very effective. He, he made a career of it, doing five minute spot every day, every day on the radio. So you can use many of the same things that we used in the introduction. The other thing that we need to pay attention to is transitions. Now, if anybody's ever used PowerPoint, you can 
create real fancy how the slides change. You'll notice that in some of my, my slides, each point comes up separately, and then I have other slides where they all come up at the same time. Well, it, what PowerPoint calls those, when you set it up to come in one at a time, or come in with little fancy circles, and little letters come in flipping around, and they call them transitions. What they're trying to do is you're guiding a person step by step. So if we're explaining a process of doing something, we might say, or let's use persuasive at this point, let's say, here are some problems. So you go through and talk about the problems. And then when you transition to the solution, you say, now these are the problems, let's talk about the solutions. It's very simple, and, but you've told them, these are the problems, now I'm gonna talk about the solutions. What's nice about this is if you, if someone even numbers it, point number one, point number two, and then, uh, and you, you really got into the point number two, then all of a sudden you hear the speaker say point number four. You know you missed a point. That makes sense? But it, because they transitioned that, you are gonna go back and say, well, okay, what was point number three? And so you, you can, but those are transitions. They clarify, you, you take them through the process. So, in conclusion, we set, we set a goal for this speech, our purpose. We talked about mind mapping. Is everybody clear on mind mapping? Are you, are you good with it? If you want some individual help, I'll, I'll be glad to help you. There's and some cool software out there too for mind mapping. That yeah, there is. Good. There's software as well. Do it simply. And we talked about how things are organized in from your introduction <laughs> to your body <laughs> to your conclusion. Um, so what what your assignment is for this? And this is something for you to start. Put me down. You don't have to turn it into me because I I will see the end result after you give give me your speech. But what I want you to do is pick a subject, if you already haven't, I'll keep it on. Um, I want you to mind map it out, and then I want you to start the process of organizing the introduction and the body and conclusion. So you start out with the body, and then you work the introduction and the conclusion. This is very important, folks. You need to start on it now. Because it's probably, I'm thinking, two, two weeks out. Because we still have to talk about PowerPoint. We still have to talk about delivery. And we got to talk about organization. So we're about two weeks out. I'm going to start, I'm going to map that out and uh, get a, establish a, a schedule of when we're gonna do the speeches so you guys can sign up for those so you know what day. But today it starts. You have to start putting it together, okay? All right.